It feels so special to be with you, actually starting from uh, you know, a greeting from Senegal. And interestingly enough, I was actually born in, in Senegal a little more than 30 years ago. At that time, we were roughly uh, 600 million people on the African continent. Today, we are 1.2 billion. And in 30 years, we will actually be 2.2 billion. And it's the fastest demographic increase that the world had witnessed because you guys in Europe, it actually took you more than 150 years to go from 250 million to 750 million inhabitants today. Even China, it will take, I think, over 100 years uh, for them to go from 500 million inhabitants to actually 1.5 billion inhabitants. And for us, it's taking at 60 years uh, to triple our demography with a much larger numbers. And of course, this come with so many opportunities and challenges. But because I'm optimistic, I will start with opportunities. On one hand, um, the demography is still something that can be turned into an opportunity. Uh, for instance, in, if you look at 2050, we'll be actually having the largest single market on the African continent since the creation of the World Trade Organization, which means you know, more consumers for your products um, and more startups for your investments. And that's huge. The second thing that is very exciting when it comes to Africa and its opportunities is actually the demograph uh, the economic uh, vitality. So out of the top 10 countries with the fastest growth worldwide, consistently for the past years, six to seven have been in Africa. A country like Cote d'Ivoire, where I have been backing entrepreneurs for the past years, is for instance recording 8% GDP growth for almost a decade. A country like Rwanda, it's the best country in the world for optic fiber. It's recording 7.5% GDP growth. So it's really happening and it's also something exciting. But I think the most exciting things when it comes to opportunities on the African continent right now is of course the, the boom that we see, the, the revolution that we see when it comes to technology adoption. And for instance, when I was, you know, um, over a decade ago, advising listed companies in Europe on how to leverage you know, the mobile revolution, I used to tell them, if you don't pay attention by 2015, you'll have you know, as many mobile internet users are actually desktop internet users. And fast forward 2015, I was actually leading the largest tech unicorn and online marketplace in Nigeria. And guess what? I had already 90, um, almost 90% 90 mobile internet users. So the adoption is very massive, and we see some countries such as Kenya, where 50% of the GDP is going through mobile financial services with a service, for instance, called M-Pesa. Um, and, and it's not only massive, but it's happening very fast. So for instance, when we were launching Jumia in Nigeria in 2012, the country had barely 47 million internet users. And uh, three years after, when I was actually leading it, we actually had doubled that number. The country had 97 million internet users. Um, and we already today have, only in Sub-Saharan Africa, I don't even count Northern Africa, more than 65% of all the world's uh, SIM cards, right? So this is something very exciting when you are a tech entrepreneur, of course. But then you have so many challenges and huge challenges. And I think uh, as much as the demography can be seen as an opportunity, so for instance, we all know that China leveraged the demographic divide to be a you know, giant manufacturer and a powerhouse globally. But for us, it's also creating this sense of urgency to create faster you know, millions, if not actually billions, but it's one billion of jobs in 30 years uh, and find innovative way to accelerate and massify the access to housing, healthcare, education, and so on and so forth. One second challenge that is very uh, strong is actually the access to financial services. Uh, here, when you need to go uh, uh, you know, um, and have access to zoo services, you have a bank at every corner, at every street, even in rural areas. Um, in Africa, we have actually only 20% of penetration rate when it comes to traditional banking. And that's, of course, a challenge for someone like me who used to be an e-commerce payer because you actually have to work with that and embrace it um, a little a bit like you do in Germany, liking a bit sometimes cash and delivery and pay and delivery because otherwise you can leave out 80% you know, of your market. Um, and there is a search challenge that is so frustrating to me uh, on a personal standpoint, which is the lack of inefficiencies of global value chains. So for instance, when I was living in, in Nigeria, 
I had very uh, much, um, I have had times uh, believing in some numbers. So for instance, the country is one of the major exporters of crude oil on Africa and on the global stage. But they actually import refined oil because they lack refining capacity. And it's because one local entrepreneur decided to go and build it, he is actually uh, Africa's uh, first billionaire right now, that we are going to turn this, you know, um, this exporting uh, craziness into actually a value addition exporting um, oil business, hopefully. It's the same for even leather. So for instance, Nigeria has one of the finest leather that they export raw to so many countries. So for instance, Italy, sometimes you buy great bags, but they're actually made sometimes from Nigerian quality leather. And at the same time, when I was leading Jumia in Nigeria, we used to see how many, you know, uh, dozens uh, of thousands of leather shoes are imported back to the country for Nigerians to wear, which doesn't make sense. Uh, and so on and so forth. It's the same for clothes. So Nigeria is a huge exporter of cotton, great quality, uh, in China, only for Nigerians to then import, uh, you know, manufactured clothes for Nigerians to wear that are made in China. It doesn't make sense, right? Economically, it doesn't make sense. Socially, it doesn't make sense. And of course, environmentally, it doesn't make sense. But what is exciting about us uh, technology uh, entrepreneurs, but also investors, is we actually see all the opportunities in all these massive challenges. And for instance, in my own background, I like to actually find one of the reasons behind the success of Jumia, not being only that we did the great job. It's also because at some point you had one retail outlet for 60,000 inhabitants on average in Africa. In, on, in the US, for instance, the average is one retail outlet for every 400 inhabitants. So here, technology has an essential role. It's an enabler of massive access to, of course, like everywhere else when it comes to online retail, so wide assortment, great price, and convenience shopping with the door delivery. It's the same for mobile financial services. I mentioned that Kenya has 50% of their GDP uh, that is coming through uh, you know, mobile and tech-enabled solutions. And it's not only because, you know, I would not say that every Kenyan farmer is necessarily technology appetent, but it's because they had needs to, add, to, to buy, to get access to credits, to micro-insurance, and these needs were never covered by traditional bankers who did not find them exciting enough or who did not find the ways to, to build the, the, the great infrastructure to be able to cater to their needs. It's the same, actually, even for access to energy. Uh, in your developed countries, you actually need to have power to be able to access the internet. And what is fascinating in Africa, you actually can use a mobile phone and a SIM card to have access to power. And for instance, you have a startup called um, Mcopa, and what they do is because they know sometimes that the purchase power in certain areas is low, they developed a pay-as-you-go uh, platform where you, they enabled 200,000 households that did not have access to electricity before uh, to access power, which is very, very powerful of the statement of how technology is a massive enabler in Africa. And you know, um, after being able to witness this amazing leapfrog potential for retail during my Jumia venture, um, I decided to take a step back and just think. And I've seen so many questions that I wanted to try and answer. The first one is, in Africa, we can't uh, use the same uh, way as other regions uh, as a focus for technology. So for instance, um, I came from the San Francisco not so long ago, and I'm so fascinated by the ecosystem, by the innovation, by the capital flowing. But I was also so depressed seeing so many people left out and all the homeless people in San Francisco. And I was like, OK, if technology is going to help create successful exits, that's great. I'm an investor, don't get me wrong. But it, it can be more than that. And in continents such as Africa, where we have such strong market failures, we actually have a responsibility to not only make money, but do a bit more, help solve social challenges and sometimes even environmental challenges by still making money and matching profit with purpose. And that's why we created Django with my team, it means tomorrow or future in Fulani, which is uh, my, my, my tribe. And basically, the idea is to say, 
we don't run away or shy away for making money because at the end of the day, it has to be a profitable business model for global investors to be able to back it and local entrepreneurs to be able to back it. But at the same time, it has to be intentionally targeted at delivering a superior return when it comes to a social impact. And we focus on three main things. The first one is how do we enable massive access to essential services, such as healthcare, education, financial services, to as many Africans as possible. The second one is how do we enable SMEs get access to global markets and right, be part, take their fair share of the global you know, trade. Africa is only 3% of the global trade, which is crazy. Uh, and one concrete example of how we did that is we realized that the uh, logistic cost compared to the value of a good in Africa could be up to 75% of the cost of the goods sold. In the US, it's 6%, which means that you know, the African SME can never be competitive on a global stage with these inefficiencies. So for instance, we backed in Cote d'Ivoire, a digital freight forwarder that is you know, reducing um, these, these barriers in terms of price, in terms of access, in terms of convenience. And, and we are very excited actually to be able to help uh, improve the global trade balance and make these SMEs go global. And why it's important? It's because in Africa you have actually roughly 20 million SMEs and they represent uh, between 20 and 40% of the GDP and they employ up to 85% of the people. So when you uplift them, you actually have an impact on the whole economy. And then it's not about being a vertical in technology, it's being an horizontal and enabling actually the real economy. And the third thing we are so passionate about, of course, is how to find business models and to fund them, help them uh, be launched and also grow and expand um, when they create job opportunities for women and youth who are always less uh, cut up to by the brick and mortar uh, system, let's say. Uh, for instance, in a country like Nigeria, you have 65% of the population which is below 25 years old. And that's why it's so exciting for us because these young female and young male, they are online, they have a smartphone. So we, for instance, love marketplaces. Uh, there is a study by the BCG that shows that by uh, 2025, we'll have three million net jobs created by online marketplaces in Africa. And it's such a great motivation for someone like me to be able to back this type of platform because uh, we need at least 20 million net jobs to be created every year to be able to employ everyone and make sure that, you know, not only they have this own economy look, uh, work opportunity economically, locally, but also we have, you know, uh, not these very sad things that happen sometimes with, you know, e economic migration because no one will migrate if they have, you know, a decent economic and stable life at home with decent access to financial services, with decent access to healthcare and education. Uh, so it's not only a matter of, let's say, uh, doing uh, well financially, it's also a matter of doing good. It's our passion, it's our mission, it's our reason for being. I will actually quote a Japanese concept, not an African one, it's our ikigai. Uh, and we hope to see more of you guys backing also this kind of opportunities because again, one, they are massive, two, they are fast growing, three, they will help you get the level of profit that you want to achieve, but four, you will go uh, to bed, I think, every night feeling much better. You'll wake up every morning also feeling more fulfilled about contributing, hopefully, to the betterment of our society. So I wish you to find your ikigai, uh, and I hope this was also a call for you to take action and to twist and change your perception about the opportunities in Africa, because there are so many for whoever is you know, bold enough, but also humble enough to go and tap into it. Nangadef Bits and Pretzels, thank you.